Old wood to burn, old wine to drink, old friends to trust, old authors to read. Alonso of Aragon. Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I am your host. I'd like to thank you all for joining me this week. Uh, if you're a newcomer, welcome. And uh, for all my returning listeners, as always, I really, really appreciate it. I hope everyone had a good week. Um, seemed that we had a you know, pretty good turnout for uh, the last episode. Still, numbers are still up. Uh, pretty good for this month. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, been very pleased with how much uh, we've gotten covered so far and uh, how how things seem to be growing here in the new year. Uh, always upward, as they say. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um... Didn't really have too much in terms of feedback from the last episode, um, but it seems like the you know the changes I made with the feedback from that uh, other episode have have gone pretty well. So uh, thank you again for all my listeners who kind of brought that up. Uh, so again, I'm going to try to be a little bit more consistent with things like etymology. Um, so, but for now, though, let's go ahead and get started with this week's subject matter. Um, we're moving out of the Middle East, West Asia, uh, to talk about crops being domesticated in neighboring uh, regions in Asia. And this will include uh, the grapevine, cotton, apples, and uh, the pomegranate. Uh, so we're going to start uh, with the grape and its vine. And it's by far the most important of the domesticates that we're going to be talking about this week. Uh, at least of the edible ones. Cotton is a little more complicated, um, but again, we're going to get into that after you know after we get through grapes. Now, uh, the English word for grapes probably came from the old French word grapper. Uh, it would mean to steal, to catch with a hook, grasp, or to kind of specifically pick the fruit of the grapevine. Uh, the exact evolution of this word is unknown, but ultimately it was from probably from the Proto-Germanic krapon. Uh, that meant something like bent, crooked, or hooked. So a grape or uh, graper or grapper uh, was probably a tool and or a person that was used to trim vines or help cut the clusters from vines. And I couldn't get an exact date on when this came into usage. Uh, I'm going to guess it's sometime after the Norman Conquest. Uh, in Old English, they would have used something like win, uh, winberry or wineberry. Uh, and wine comes from the Latin winum, of course, uh, meaning wine, uh, which they probably had from the Proto-Indo-European uh, uh, and I'm going to butcher this probably, oina. Now, the Latin for grape was uva, which is still used by the Spanish, Italians, and uh, I believe the Portuguese as well. Also, the alcoholic beverage uh, grappa, which is traditionally considered an Italian invention, uh, which is made from, the, I think, distilling like the skins, pulp, seeds, and stems left over after the winemaking, uh, basically, you're distilling the the refuse of the of the wine, and it got its name uh, from the same Proto-Germanic source, Crapon, and that's um, probably came into use from Italian from um, probably uh, the Vandals or the um, Lombards, who were a Germanic-speaking uh, peoples, I believe. Or I know the Lombards were. I'm not so sure about the Vandals. I, I need to double check that. Uh, now, the first signs of domestication of grapes appear in the archaeological record in the Caucasus Mountains in the modern country of Georgia. And these finds date to around 6000 BC and, you know, with possibilities for earlier, later dates by 100 years or so. Uh, so it's possible this process process started towards the end of last season. It's possible it could happen a couple hundred years after this season starts. Whatever the exact period of domestication, though, um, this process accelerated very quickly, a lot like olives, because by 4000 BC, 
at least one winery had been established in what is now Armenia. And when I say winery, I mean a location solely dedicated to the growing of, growing of grapevines and to the creation and storage of wine. Uh, no other types of plants were grown there. It doesn't look like people were living at the site, you know, like a large number of people. It looks like it was a small group that would be there, you know, during the winemaking process or during the planting or harvesting. It, it's not something that is, you know, a, a major site in terms of human population numbers. Uh, so it's probably a site that supported a number of neighboring people's nearby settlements, something along those lines. Now, um, grapes are uh, produce yeast naturally on their skin, so it makes uh, sense that they would make a very good basis for an alcoholic Greek. Uh, wine produced at this site and others would be stored for long term, uh, and for by when I say long term, I mean long term for that period, uh, they would store it in pottery, which was beginning to be produced and spread all around uh, the areas bordering the Caucasus. And the development of pottery in the Middle East and the Caucasus regions also seems to have played you know, a very key role in encouraging production and in spreading the first wines. Uh, ceramic containers are able to to preserve wine far better than like plaster or, or uh, leather containers uh, that were used during the um, kind of the start of this uh, domestication process. Of course, plaster is far too porous, and uh, I think there's a chemical reaction uh, involved that can make the wine taste odd. Um, that would you know make it not suitable for you know long-term storage. You know, basically, you would be able to pour it in plaster and drink it, but after that, uh, you couldn't let it sit too, too long. And, of course, um, sealed animal skins, leather bags, that kind of thing, uh, you, you can't really store wine for very long periods. You know, you could, you could carry it around with you, but after, after a while, it's, it's going to go bad. Now, uh, once pottery made it to wine-producing regions, though, people are quickly uh, uh, able to s figure out ways to use them to store wine for longer and longer periods. Of course, before stoneware and glazing was developed, there are still storage problems that can arise due to the nature of early earthenware pottery in this region. Um, However, they do come up with an early kind of preservation method. Uh, then, and this allows uh, wine to be stored for longer periods and probably helped make the earliest pottery uh, in that area a little more watertight. And this, uh, this is tree resin. A lot of early pottery shards reveal that uh, resin was added to the pottery before the wine was added and allowed to ferment. Um, and why they first decided to use resin, I'm not sure. Maybe the resin, you know, did lessen seepage of the pottery and they used it for other types of preservation of other materials, possibly. Um... And resin prevents bacteria from growing and has some small antibacterial properties as well. And that can kill some levels of bacteria that maybe had already grown. Uh, so, um, now I would think that the resin wouldn't be good for the flavor, but apparently it's not necessarily, you know, a deal breaker. Uh, there are some places that still produce uh, resin, resonated wine. Uh, I think uh, particularly in Greece, they have something that's called uh, Retzina uh, that you can still purchase. I think they produce it commercially there. Now, how long this extended a wine's lifespan, I couldn't really get a firm number on. A lot of sources that I've read say that before like the 1500s BC, wine couldn't be aged much beyond a year. Uh, so I'm be willing to bet that this early method uh, and the containers available to these people, um, you wouldn't be able to extend it for more than a couple of months. 
Um, and as for how much wine could be stored in the pots they used, uh, I think the estimate right now, the most recent one I read, was that it was somewhere around uh, five liters uh, worth of wine that could be stored in the pots, pottery that they were using at that winery location. And generally speaking, uh, you don't get too much variance in terms of size. Like you would, if you're, you know, if you're taking the time to transport this stuff, you'd, you'd want a, a decent number in, um, or a decent amount in those pots, but you'd also want uh, pots that were easily transportable. So anything much larger, you're getting into a very hard uh, transportation uh, problem, at least for the technology available at the time that we're discussing. Now, while wine's probably the primary product associated with grapes, the fruit, of course, has many other uses. Uh, you can, of course, just eat them off the vine. You can dry them to make raisins or currants. And, of course, their, their juice doesn't have to be fermented. You could make grape juice much quicker than wine. Uh, and it can also be used to make jams and jellies. Um, now, I know that today there are different varieties of grape, and they're used to make different bride products, but at this early period, that is not really the case. Although there are several varieties of grapes around the world, including in North America. Uh, these other variants don't get domesticated until much later. Uh, as for the original variety, these are Wheatus winifera, and these are the ones that spread all through the Mediterranean and Middle East. And I think I've read something like that there are around 5,000 varieties of this plant, and that includes both red and green varieties. And as for the color, there are of course red and white grapes. Uh, now the red grapes can actually range in color from red to purple to black and white grapes are actually green though they can range from of course uh, light green which I think most of us at least here in the US are very familiar with to a, a much darker one. Now I tried to find out which grapes were older uh, and if you google the question most of the general public and sources like Quora or Reddit or things like that say that green grapes are older. And, you know, most people can be forgiven for thinking that, as all grapes start out as green. And then, uh, for red grapes at least, as they mature, uh, they become darker. Uh, however, an article I found from the Plant Journal, the Plant Journal, Plant Journal by Walker et al. Uh, from February 2007 shows that, um, white grapes are the newer variety uh, and I'll try to remember include the link to the article if anyone is interested in the details of the science but you could easily find it via Google the article is available for free uh, now the article didn't have an exact time frame uh, that the mutation for remaining for grapes remaining green arose um, but due to the relatively small number of green varieties compared to red, I think it's fairly safe to assume that humans had a very big hand in spreading uh, that, those varieties, if not outright developing it. Um, as for wine varieties, white wine is mentioned by the Egyptians fairly early on, but it wasn't as widespread as red wine for them, and it isn't mentioned by Greek sources until after the Archaic and or Homeric periods. And I don't think any Roman sources specify white wine until uh, the first century AD, at least as, much, as well as I could figure out. Not to say those peoples didn't have access to these white wines earlier, but it was probably a very niche uh, or much less available product uh, than red wine, which was much more ubiquitous and widespread. Uh, now we should move on over to cotton. Now, cotton came into English from the French coton. Uh, the French got it from either the Spanish, Italian, or Provençal languages. And any one of or all three of these tongues picked it up from the Arabic word kutun. Uh, whether this was an original Arabic word or if they got it from the Egyptians is debated. Again, remember Arabic and Egyptian are uh, both Afro 
Asiatic languages. Now, I mentioned that cotton was complicated to talk about, and the reason for this is that radically different versions of cotton are domesticated at different places and different times. Uh, both of these times do fall under this season's purview, though. Uh, the issue is how, I, how I've chosen to talk about the plants here. Uh, the problem really comes from geography. Uh, we have cotton plants in the old world and cotton plants in the new world. Uh, that said, they're different enough for me to talk about in separate episodes, though, because there are differences between the varieties, fairly major ones, as we'll get to. Now, the cotton that was most familiar to the old world, uh, which is, again, Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, is known as tree cotton, or by its scientific name, uh, Gossypium arboreum. Now, this plant grew naturally in the Indian subcontinent, and, uh, and despite the name being uh, what it is, it is a little deceptive. The plant is actually a shrub, and it usually grows between two to three meters, which is uh, six to nine feet. Um, the plant's leaves and seeds have plenty of uses. Uh, food preparation, the seeds can make oil, and they have uh, leaves, uh, excuse me, the oil uh, and the seeds and the leaves all have some medicinal properties. How good those medicinal properties are is a little bit matter of debate but they they do have uses um such as um helping remove placenta after birth or to increase uh, lactation in nursing women um i think also that there are ways that they can be used for um ab abortives uh for fetuses of course though the primary reason that uh this cotton was grown though was for the soft white, white fiber or bowl surrounding the seeds. Uh, now these fibers would be spun together to make yarns which were then woven into soft comfortable breathable pieces of clothing. I think most of us at least in the English speaking world and especially in the south are very familiar with cotton clothing. Um, which in the environment where these plants were typically grown um, would be much more comfortable in warmer weather than wool or leather garments. Um, the fact the fibers are white also make it very easier to dye uh, cotton uh, specific colors. And this property of cotton would of course only become more important as time goes on and humans learn to develop uh, more and more shades of colors for dyes. Now, the earliest evidence of cotton being harvested and used as clothing dates to around 5500 BC. Uh, there were small cotton fibers found in jewelry at the Marigar site that we talked about last season. Uh, they'd be found in the holes where strings or whatever would go through uh, pieces of jewelry. Uh, there are other sites nearby dated to slightly later where more cotton fibers have been found and it is very probable that the finished cloths were traded out of the Indian subcontinent very far and very wide very very quickly though how aware the people they're trading with realize that this cloth is spun from plants is not known of course people are familiar with flax Flax clothing's not unheard of, but cotton, you know, if you were just feeling the material, you might think it was closer to um, wool than flax, even though flax and cotton are both plants, and wool, of course, is an animal byproduct. Now, here we get into some more speculation and mystery about cotton. Uh, there is another variety of cotton tree known as Gossypium her uh, herbacum or Levantine cotton. This variety of the plant is native to Sub-Saharan Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and the Southern Levant. Now, there isn't firm evidence of this plant's domestication until much later, uh, which is around 3,2500 BC, though there are those that argue it could have been as early as 5,000 BC. And this early date is very, very highly 
contested, and I couldn't find an actual scholarly uh, scholarly source or journal that listed it. Uh, but if anyone has a link to any actual scientific paper or journal, or even just an author's name that said this, I please let me know. Uh, a lot of places I see it are on like sites that just talk about Levantine cotton, and they don't have any sources or anything like that. Um, now, of course, another thing that kind of throws gum into the works is that um, Levantine cotton and tree cotton look extremely similar to each other. And in a lot of cases, um, you can't tell them apart just from looking at them, at them alone. You have to genetically test uh, the specimens to determine uh, which is which. And, um, of course... Uh, Age on certain uh, samples can affect DNA testing. Uh, it makes it much harder if something's too old. So it's hard to accurately date samples to find older examples of Levantine cotton. Just because, again, uh, there's so little of it and or uh, the places where it would grow, be grown and domesticated do not um, are not conducive to finding um, that type of material to test at that age, I guess. Um, so far, we've kind of been limited to what we have found in the archaeological record and at later periods. Um, there has been some cross-pollination of the Levantine variety with the Indian cotton tree. Um, Egypt will become a major producer of this cotton as well as their southern neighbors. And control of this resource will be a factor in several conflicts in this region once we get to the historical period. Now, I'm sure Egypt was exporting cotton like the various Indian polities, but either they were very limited in the amount they exported and or they were keeping the nature of the garden garments hidden as the Greeks who definitely traded with the Egyptians for a very long period of time didn't know about cotton trees until after the Alexander the Great's conquests and even then they apparently heard about it from Indian sources um, but I'm, I'm kind of getting in my head of myself here so um, hopefully by the time we get to crop domestication next season we will have a much clearer picture to talk about or correct um, and we will talk about the American strains of cotton in a couple of weeks. Um, for now, though, uh, we're going to go ahead and end, uh, end the discussion about cotton uh, trees, and we're going to move on to pomegranates. Now, the name for this fruit came into the English lexicon around the 1300s, uh, directly from the French term pomegranate. Uh, and this descends from the medieval Latin term Pomum granatum, which literally means apple or fruit with many seeds. Uh, pomum in Latin could mean apple or just fruit in general. And as we're going to talk about, uh, a lot of European languages, their word for apple was the default word for fruit that wasn't some type of berry. Um, and even if the term they use for apple isn't necessarily the pie word for fruit, um, they would typically only refer to, they would typically only have like one kind of word or one word for fruit in general. And then as they interacted with more fruit, they would adopt either their neighbor's name for the fruit or they would add something to the word for fruit to kind of uh, distinguish the different varieties. So apparently the, the whoever the Proto-Indo-Europeans were, they didn't really have access to too many varieties uh, wherever they were living. Uh, and that's something we're going to go into um, when we talk about the Proto-Indo-Europeans um, and about probably something we should maybe focus on when it comes to like comparative linguistics and things like that. Um, for now, though, let, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Let's get back to the kind of etymology. Um, now, um, Latin used pomum, malus, pupilla, and papilla all to refer to fruit or apples. And again, this is one of those things where they would kind of 
change what they were using uh, over time. Classical Latin referred to uh, pomegranate as malum granatum, uh, which is seeded apple, or malum punicum, which is punic apple, uh, which is also the scientific name for the pomegranate tree, uh, malum punicum. Now, the origin of pomum isn't agreed on. It is possibly from an earlier form of Latin that used poemo, or possibly poomo or peomo, uh, which would have meant to pick or take off of a tree. Um, it could have also been from another neighboring language to Latin that they adopted. Uh, now, the Roman goddess of fruit trees and their care and orchards was also called Pomona. So there is some type of relation uh, with that word. And granatum is a feminine form of granum or uh, granatum, which is grain or grass. And again, the pie of grain would be something like grino or grino. So uh, it's a pregnant or seeded crop, uh, in this case, a seeded apple. Also, in medieval Latin, granatum will also eventually become a word to describe dark, burnt reds, so it will begin to refer to uh, garnet. In, uh, I believe the French language adopts that, and uh, of course that comes into English as well. Um, so, presumably, the shade of the, the gem or jewel um, would be associated with the color of that fruit. Uh, now, pomegranates originally grew in the wild somewhere between modern Iran and the very northwest of modern-day India. Uh, they were probably first domesticated somewhere along the border between Afghanistan and Iran, the, today's countries, obviously. And um, they grow on small shrub-like trees, and they these trees uh, grow anywhere between 5 to 10 meters, which is, uh, I believe, 15 to about 32 feet in height. And they um, they live for, or they can live for quite a while. Uh, I think in most cases, if they're well, well, uh, well cared for, uh, the trees can get to over 300 years in age. It usually takes around... Uh, somewhere between three to six years uh, for the trees to mature and bear their fruit. Um, now, uh, pomegranates obviously are eaten for their very sweet um, uh, seeds that come out of it, uh, but if you allow them to ripen for a little bit longer, they will you know, become more and more sour. Uh, and we're not really sure how people in different places preferred them, um, but they were very popular. Uh, they spread uh, very, very quickly all along the known ancient world. Um, it gets to uh, Egypt. I think um, they found dried pomegranates in tombs of Egyptian royalty and their retainers. Uh, we know that there are some that... Um, got into uh, places in uh, like the far uh, west of modern day Turkey uh, even before you know the I think the 1500s BC uh, and it of course becomes very popular in China and Southeast Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia probably got it through trade with India. Uh, China we're not sure if it came in through um, the Turin Basin or if it was also traded via sea from peoples living in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, modern Kandahar, I think in Afghanistan, uh, is very well known for uh, some of its um, <coughs> very, very high quality uh, pomegranates. Uh, now, in addition to eating just the fruits themselves, you can, of course, make uh, juices from them. Uh, you can add them to uh, other dishes. I think uh, places in Iran will add them to soups. Uh, in modern day Turkish uh, cuisine, you'll see them a lot with um, add to lamb chops. 
uh, are, are put with um, herbed uh, potatoes, things like that. And also, in addition to serving as you know a food stuff, uh, I did talk about dyes. Uh, the red in pomegranate, uh, very good source for red dyes. In fact, there are some places where uh, the pomegranates maybe were not the best tasting, but you know you could use that um, the red uh, liquid obtained from. Uh, the crushing the berries up would be useful in a lot of very very early dyes, and because of their you know particular uh, climate that they enjoy, they can be grown in quite a number of places that are not where they're originally from. So um, even today, you see them grown um, in. Uh, of course, where they were grown historically, but they've also started to be grown in um, uh, places like California as well here in the, the U.S. Uh, also, I think uh, they have some in Chile and Peru, although I don't know how big that market is. I don't know if it uh, if Chile and Peru necessarily are able to grow that many because of their, their uh, climate, but I'm honestly not sure. I didn't really look into that too much, so... Uh, yeah, so that is good for the pomegranate. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to apples. Now, uh, apples, uh, the, uh, excuse me. So, uh, the modern word comes to us from the Old English, apple, and it was really, again, any kind of fruit. Fruit in general, except for berries. Uh, but it also included nuts, interestingly enough. Um, and before English adopted their term for dates uh, that we talked about last week, uh, they were called uh, finger apple or finger apples. Now, uh, apple descended from the Proto-Germanic apelas, uh, which itself is descended from the Proto-Indo-European word hebel or apple. Uh, now, uh, apples are kind of interesting. Uh, the scientific name is Malus domestica, which uh, Malus, again, as we talked about, one of the Latin words for apple. Uh, also, I believe the Greeks had a similar word for um, apple to Malus. Uh, I think it was melo or something along those lines. Uh, not really pertinent to the etymology of it, uh, for, for us, for English speakers at least. Uh, now, apples are originally from somewhere in South, or I'm sorry, excuse me, in Central Asia. Um, somewhere in the Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, border regions, Northwest China, I guess, would be in there as well. Somewhere, somewhere along the, um, probably the original, like, the base that became the domesticated species would be uh, somewhere probably along the Tian Shan Mountains. Um, there are a lot of trees kind of in the run up to the uh, the actual mountains themselves. So it probably came from somewhere in those forests. Um, now, there are a huge variety of apples over, I think, over 7,000. Um so even more than grapes. Uh, apples also are extremely diverse in terms of uh, in terms of um, uh, genetic diversity. And I don't mean that merely in terms of all the different varieties of trees. I mean in terms of every individual apple on those trees. Uh, apples are very... Uh, there, there's been a lot of cross-pollination between a number of different species, both domesticated and not, or species that were wild and then inter, you know, cross-pollinated with domesticated species and then vice versa. So you'll get a lot of different um, uh, varieties of apples, even from seeds uh, of a specific type of apple. When you, If you plant those seeds, you may get a type of apple that is not anything like what you ate and you got the seeds from initially. Um, this is a, a survival mechanism. Uh, apples are probably, they, they 
probably developed this to help protect themselves from pests. Uh, say if their parents were specifically vulnerable to one type of pests, uh, they would produce a large number of fruit that was not vulnerable to that specific type of illness or disease or insect. Now that's not to say that they don't produce anything like the parent, I guess, apple would, but they they vary greatly from seed to seed, from tree to tree. Um, and I, I tried to dive in on this a lot, but I realized like that could be a whole episode. Like that's something that might need to do an episode on or orchards. Um, apples are not the only plant or not the only fruit tree to do this, but they are by far the most prolific one that does this. Um, now, the original, I guess, um, the original ancestor of the domesticated species is an apple known as uh, Malus cerversi, uh, and you can again find it in those regions we talked about. Uh, and it was uh, very uh, early on, it was, uh, I guess, kind of cross-pollinated with um, another apple uh, called um, Malus uh, silverstus, or I'm sorry, Malus silvestris, uh, which is the, the crab apple. Uh, and these are mostly in Europe and Western Asia. Um so those and those have very like bright yellow um, uh, rinds, I guess, or, or skins um, compared to the um, the Sea of Ersi, which is again more of a kind of a pink or a light red. And then of course again, they there are other types of wild apples kind of in that chain, and they all kind of got cross bred with each other. So um, that's part of the reason why there are so many. Uh, types of apples and uh, again because another thing that kind of points to the I guess the homeland for the first apples uh, is how diverse the different apple trees in that region of Central Asia is um, and uh, in addition to taste we're talking about colors the size of trees you can get some that can go from like two to five meters which is like six to uh, 16 feet you can get some that are much shorter um or i'm sorry you can get some that are um um that are much uh, taller uh you can get some that can go up to 30 feet i think in the wild um so uh, apples uh, very widespread that's part of the reason because they cross pollinate well too uh, there's a lot of ways you can control uh, the flavors or you, you know not control but you can um, influence how they taste um, and there are varieties all over I think um, there are variety and this is one again one of those plants that just explodes once it kind of gets, you know, properly or even semi understood by humans, uh, I think that there are places in Italy that have um, uh, apples uh, t dating to around 4,000 BC, so the very end of this season. And um, now it's not known. I don't think they have been able to successfully like analyze the genetics on those apples, but. Um, it could be a crab apple or it could be a domestic uh, apple tree, like a Malus domesticus, with the ancestry from the, um, from the, the Central European steppe, the Sia, uh, the uh, Cerversi, or Cyversi, I guess is another way it might be pronounced. So, um, apples, very important. Um, they're a good fruit. You plant them, of course, in the fall. They blossom during the uh, spring, and then you you harvest them in um, uh, the the mid to late summer uh, to get uh, to get uh, apples. Of course, you can let them ripen. In fact, I think that was kind of the the main way you would do it uh, for most of the. Um, for most of human history, you'd let them get riper on the vine. Um, 
you can of course use them to make um, uh, liquors you can use it to flavor alcohol in addition to just straight up eating them so um, you know it's a good it's a good fruit and it's you know pretty understandable why it would become widespread uh, also there's a lot of religious connotations with apples um, some of that is due to translations of the the Bible um, a lot of um, again I talked about a lot of European languages the the default word for fruit uh, just also ending up being the default word for apple uh, leads like uh, when you read Genesis in the Bible uh, you know when a lot of art and just popular media and just in general um, translations when they talk about you know Eve eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge it's usually depicted as an apple um, even though in the original uh, I guess or at least what we have is the oldest translations or the oldest um, Hebrew versions of the Bible. It's not necessarily, it doesn't say apple, it just it just means fruit. It could be anything. In fact, there are some scholars that argue that the fruit that they're eating is not the fruit of a tree, but actually like the fruit in terms of like grain, uh, that they're eating like the fruit of, you know, grown plants, like domesticated plants, and it's uh, kind of a... Um, a metaphor which that's something we'll get into when we get to um you know uh talking about religion and mythologies and that kind of stuff um but it's not just of course christianity uh or the abrahamic faiths that have affinities with apples uh they show up in a number of different uh religious and mythological stories all over the world from other faiths and traditions as well um of course, the apple does not show up in the New World until after the Columbian Exchange happens when it's brought over by Europeans. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's um, it's kind of the apple. I would like to go into a lot more detail on like how you get um, or how you control the type of apples or better control the type of apples you're getting from your planted trees. Um, but there's a lot of science jargon and science like that is not my strong suit. Um, so if there's any help, if anyone has a article or like a book or maybe even a video to watch, I would be very, very happy to try and get through that and maybe do an episode on orchards and, uh, apple, uh, I guess, or just any kind of fruit picking. Cause I know I kind of did that with the, um, with, uh, just general, uh, farming and like shelling of wheat and that kind of thing and what the process involved, um, would be for that um obviously with trees they're probably a little less uh intensive in terms of just bat breaking physical labor not to say that it's not hard work to tend an orchard it certainly is um but it's a different kind of hard work in terms of physical uh physicalness and i'm sure you have to there's a lot more to take there's different things to take into account at least in terms of um health and pest control and that kind of thing and i'd like to know the differences between them um also um there are uh of course toxicity associated with apples uh their um seeds can contain cyanide uh so they have been used to make poison in the past that's not unique to apples um, arsenic is also sometimes involved with that. Um, so you have to be very careful not to eat apple seeds, or if you do, not to eat too many of them. Um, and that's something I'm, you know, people have known about probably almost as long as they've been growing them, or at least harvesting them in the wild. Um, Trying to think if there was anything else I wanted to mention specifically about them. Um, uh, I, I do think also that the potential for poisoning on apple seeds is a little overstated. It's extremely rare that you eat that many, um, but it can be done. And again, you, people can like maliciously like harvest the the cyanide and things like that from apples, uh, and that's not naturally not. 
I don't believe that's naturally occurring in the fruits themselves. I think that's part of the growing process. They're absorbing that from the um, from the soils and things like that. That that gets into the seeds from that process. But um, I'm not 100% sure on that one. Um, but yeah, so um, we've got uh, those four out of the way, and that finishes up, I guess. Uh, Everything outside of East, or yeah, outside of East Asia, Southeast Asia, um, at least for this season. I'm sure there's might be some other stuff I may have missed, um, but we'll be back next week. Um, I'm gonna try and finish up Asia, though it might take another episode or two uh, to finish up uh, East Asia. At that point, I know I've got some stuff to dive into there, uh, and then of course we'll talk about Europe. Uh, Europe does have some crops that are native to it, but I don't know that there's that many that are being domesticated at this time frame. A lot of the peoples practicing agriculture in Europe are coming from Asia, so they're bringing their crops that they already know with them. Um, and they don't really begin experimenting until later, or the people, you know, the peoples already in Europe learn from them and they begin to some experimenting i guess with the the wild strains there but there there's at least one i know about maybe two so that might be like a half an episode and then i'll start on uh, north america and S south america after that um but yeah so um pretty pretty good episode i feel like um if you have any questions or comments or if you have uh any sources that i asked for or mentioned uh, please, please let me know. Uh, you can reach me at email uh, via waradrevpod at gmail.com. You can contact me via direct message on X slash Twitter, or you can comment on any of the YouTube videos um, on my YouTube channel, which I will have a link to the episode there on uh, the episode description. Um, but yeah, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And I hope you have a good rest of your day whenever you're listening to this. And a good rest of your week whenever you're listening to this. Thank you all. I'll see you all next time. Peace.